also on Friday and Saturday night, 7.30 each night. So uh, hopefully you can attend live, but if uh, those from out of state and around the world, they, they can uh, also tune in live as well through our uh, live streaming uh, that's found right on our website. So uh, hopefully you can join us for that. should be a great conference uh, with Pastor Bill Wenstrom and Dr. Vaughn uh, Mancha uh, speaking on Saturday night as well. So looking forward to that. And uh, that'll be just this Thursday. So can't wait for that. All right, so let's get started as we normally do with a moment of silent prayer, utilizing 1 John 1 9, if necessary, to name any known sins that we might have committed since we last with, spoke with God the Father to ensure fellowship with God, which also means we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. So, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> And Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this evening in praise and in worship and in glorification of your name, and also of the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we can't thank you enough for your plan of salvation and entering us into that plan, giving us personal salvation, uh, where we have eternal life and the uh, great inheritance that is waiting for us in the eternal state. We thank you for your spirit that indwells us and also empowers us through his filling, that gives us strength and power to go forward each and every day to glorify and Father, we thank you for your word that also edifies our soul that we can learn and the, we're, what, that which we're about to partake of, to learn and grow closer with you and also your son, Jesus Christ, growing closer in our relationship and our fellowship with you uh, so we understand and learn more about you and can walk in your will and plan uh, more and more each and every day. So, Father, we thank you for our nation. We ask that you continue to watch over it, protect and guide it, to be with our president and all those in civilian government at our federal, state, and local levels. We ask that you lead them to make decisions that are in line with your word and your divine establishment principles. We pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world. We ask that you protect and guide them all, especially those in harm's way. And we ask that you bring healing to those who have been wounded physically or spiritually. And also for those who have given the greatest sacrifice and given their lives, we thank you, Father, for their service and sacrifice. And we ask that you be with their loved ones and bring comfort into their souls through your word and through your spirit. So, Father, we again thank you for this day and this, the freedoms that we have within our nation. And now this time of praise and worship where we can study your word freely and openly without coercion. And we ask that you continue to bless our nation and provide these things for us so that we glorify your name and the name of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Mary Ellen's not with us, but I'll have Cheryl come forward to help us sing our doxology. <clears throat> if you don't rise, please. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship your holy name. Thank you very much, and please be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for the doxology. And now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Ephesians, book of Ephesians in chapter 1. And as you know, we find ourselves now in verse 20 and finishing that up uh, this evening. And then uh, when we come back next Tuesday after the conference, we'll get into verses uh, 21 through 23 that uh, round out this chapter. Then we'll get into uh, chapter 2 where we'll really be talking about salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's uh, very appropriate that that's going to be coming up right after our conference because we're going to talk about witnessing and uh, the salvation message and evangelism. And then chapter 2 is really all about that uh, as well. So uh, God uh, works it all together for good. All right, so in verse 20, well, going back to verse 18, to have Paul's prayer. Remember, it's a prayer of thanksgiving for the, the early church and the church-age believers. 
Also, he has an intercessory prayer for them as he keeps mentioning them in his prayers to God the Father. And then in regard to them, he prays, as it says in verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Now in verse 20, we see what that power is. He says, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, when he resurrected him to eternal life, and then seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And when we get into uh, verse 21, we're going to be talking next week, we'll be talking a little bit about more about the angelic conflict because all those rules, po rulers, powers, and authorities are really talking about uh, fallen angels and the hierarchy of fallen angels. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But as we see here, Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And uh, as we've been noting this doctrine of ascension, remember the power that resurrected Jesus Christ is the same power that seated him at his right hand, the power of God the Father, the power of God the Holy Spirit, to resurrect the body of Jesus Christ, and then also to have Jesus Christ take the throne of God seated at the right hand of the Father. And that power that was used to raise Jesus Christ and then give him authority is the same power that is given to us. Therefore, God can work within our lives in very powerful ways, and God can also give us authority to go forward in this life. And remember, the authority that you have, we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, during the conference, is that you have the authority of an ambassador, you have the authority of being a priest, and in both cases, it's royalty associated with your ambassadorship and your priesthood. You have authority to go forward in the plan of God and be a witness for God, a, a spokesperson for God, to be his uh, manifestation during our generation as Christ was his manifestation during uh, his advent 2,000 years ago. So the power that resurrected Christ is the same power that seated him, is the same power that's available to us to apply to our everyday lives so that we can go forward being overcomers in this life, conquerors in this life, overcoming sin, Satan, whatever temptations that the world may throw at us, we can overcome them because of the power of God within our lives. So we've been noting this doctrine of the session of Jesus Christ so that we can understand what that is, and ultimately in definition, I'll remind you of these things. The session of our Lord Jesus Christ occurred 40 days after his uh, resurrection when he ascended to heaven. Forty days after resurrection, he ascended on high, and that's what we see in Acts chapter 1. And then when he ascended into heaven, that's when God the Father seated him at his right hand and gave him all authority at that time. And ultimately, all authority is in the hands of Jesus Christ, and uh, we'll see all that authority coming under him when we too get to the heavenly state ourselves. But the session of Jesus Christ demonstrates the victory of the cross, and it Really, without the cross, you wouldn't have the resurrection. Without the cross, you wouldn't have the, sec uh, the session of Jesus Christ. The cross is that strategic victory of the angelic conflict. And ultimately, the session of Jesus Christ is the cherry on top of the hot fudge sundae, as we could say. All right, The cross is the hot fudge sundae. The resurrection is the whipped cream that tops it. And then we could say the session is the cherry that's on top. And when you put it all together, you have what? A nice hot fudge Sunday. Well, in this case, we have the strategic victory of the angelic conflict and all the varying aspects of it. The victory won at the cross over sin and death was demonstrated through the resurrection, Jesus Christ coming back to eternal life, and now in humanity having power and authority over all of God's creation under his feet is also signifying the victory over sin, Satan, and death. And we note that in 1 Kings 2, Jeremiah 22, and Psalm chapter 44, verse 4. Now, we noted on Sunday the first four points, which was started with definition. Then, secondly, we noted the prophecy of his session in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, where David said, My Lord said to my Lord, talking about God the Father, saying to God the Son, Be seated at my right hand. So David isn't the one that's going to come back and establish the eternal throne for the Jews. 
David is not going to sit on the eternal throne of Israel, but a son of his, his offspring. And as he said, my Lord said to my Lord, my God the Father said to my God the Son, who is incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, sit at my right hand. He was prophesying that Jesus Christ would have all authority for all of eternity, including the throne of David that will exist for Israel forever and ever and ever. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, that's when Daniel said, he saw one coming like the Son of Man, coming to the Ancient of of days, talking about Jesus Christ ascending to heaven and coming to God the Father who sits on the throne, and then we know that he was seated at his right hand. As we've also noted, he, uh, the session is in, in regard to the resolution of the angelic conflict. We noted that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, and we also see that here in our own passage in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21, as I read. Again, his session far above all rule, authority, and powers. All of angelic creatures, all of the fallen angels, Jesus Christ, who was lower than them for a period of time because he took on humanity, is now higher than them in his resurrection form, just as you and I will be higher than them in our resurrection form as well. Then our fourth point, which we left off on Sunday, is that his session is related to the eff efficacy of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf and on behalf of all of mankind on the cross. And so because God the Father was perfectly satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the payment of the penalty of our sins. God the Father was righteously and justly able to seat Jesus Christ at his right hand and give him all power and authority because he completed the work of salvation at the cross. Acts chapter 5, 31, Hebrews 10, 12. So we pick it up this evening with point number five, where we understand that the present session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is related to his sovereign rulership. So we know that Jesus Christ as God is always sovereign. He is co-equal, co-infinite, and co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And in that, he shares essence and attribute equally, infinitely, and eternally. Therefore, he is sovereign, just as much as the Father and the Holy Spirit are. But now we're talking about the humanity of Jesus Christ and in the hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man. And Jesus Christ in hypostatic union is the sovereign ruler of this world and ultimately of all of creation as well. So this session gave authority to the person of Jesus Christ, who is now in hypostatic union in resurrection form, seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's related to the award of the third royal title that our Lord was given, which now we call call him the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we see that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, and in that great passage in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, when Jesus Christ comes back in his second advent, riding on that white horse, and we are coming back with him to wipe out Satan and his demonic forces and all the evil forces of this world at the end of the tribulation, he will adorn that title on his body, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And also we, what goes with that is the bright and morning star. And it's interesting, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he, who are the kings here? Well, we are kings because we're royalty. We're royal priests and royal ambassadors. And he's the king over all the kings, which you and I are kings. Lord of Lords, who are the little Lord, the little L Lords? Well, that's all the angelic creatures as well. They're all Lords, and Jesus Christ is the Lord over the Lords. And then that phrase, the bright morning star, why does he take on that? Because that was also the title of Satan back before his rebellion. He was known as the bright morning star. That was the title that was given to him. And that's what the word Lucifer really means, uh, translated into the Latin. But ultimately, that title was given to Satan. Jesus Christ took that back, and now it is his title, and he is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He is the ultimate ruler of all of mankind, and all all of angelic kind as well. And this is, as, as we say, part of his third, or oh, the third royal patent that he has, and which also means that he has two other royal titles. His first royal title is the Son of God, and his royal family is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. 
His second royal title is the son of David, and his royal family as the son of David, as the ruler of Israel, is the, the, the true Israelites, again, believing Jews who will be in the eternal state. That's his royal family for that title. Now he is given a third title, the king of kings and the lord of lords, but he had no family to go with that initially. So what did God do? God is now calling out a royal family called the church age believers, and all the church age believers will be the royal family of this third royal patent title that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has received and will adorn for all of eternity. So he's the son of God, royalty and deity, son of David, royalty of the Israelites, king of kings, lord of lords, royalty over all of creation, both angelic and human creation. So this title in, in indicates that, rulership over all of creation, and especially the church. And that's what uh, we're going to get into a little bit more, too. And we're going to talk about Jesus Christ being the head, and we are the body. We're in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. It says, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church. Again, not just head of all things, but head of all things to the church. So we understand that he is the head and we are the body. This authority and rulership that he has is especially over his church, the royal family of God, the church age believer, that is now being called out and will be completed one day, and that's when the rapture of the church will occur. And as you know, uh, we're, uh, right now is the calendar of the celebration of Rosh Hashanah. And we're on the tail end of that celebration right now. If you looked at the moon or saw the moon tonight, you'd see that little, little bitty sliver of the new moon that is coming. And ultimately, that was the sign to the Israelites to celebrate the Rosh Hashanah festival. And the Rosh Hashanah festival is what? The Feast of Trumpets. And our Lord Jesus Christ is going to call us uh, back home. And ultimately, the rapture of the church is at the last trumpet when the trumpet sounds. So the Feast of Trumpet Trumpets is associated with the rapture and resurrection of the body of Christ called the church, which he is head over. And as I said, uh, tongue-in-cheek to you uh, uh, on Sunday, I believe, if we do have the conference on Thursday night, we're going to be around for another year, at least, okay? So if we get to Thursday night, which we probably will, we're going to be here for another year, so plan accordingly. All right, and, and uh, make sure you buy me Christmas presents, all right? But in any case, <laughs> just kidding. All right, but in any case, uh, 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 Jesus Christ is the head over the church. This is a, a unique authority that he has as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will rule us over us for all all of eternity, also being his wife for all of eternity as well. But as him being the head and us the body, remember that's one unit. The head and the body go together. So where Christ is, we too will be. And that's why we have this inheritance waiting for us that is in Christ. Christ's inheritance, we're going to enjoy because we're his body, he's the head. The rulership and authority of Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, we're going to enjoy and we're going to participate in because he's the head and we are the body. And so as the head thinks and then the body does motion or acts, that's how God is going to use us in the eternal state. As Jesus Christ sits on that throne and he decides to do something with the angelic creature, creatures or the human race that is resurrected and in heaven or whatever else is created in the eternal state, as Jesus Christ thinks it, he's going to have us go out and make it happen. Make it so, as they would say on Star Trek. Make it so, all right? But that's what Jesus Christ is going to do for us. He's going to utilize us in that fantastic way as we too will participate in his rulership during the millennial reign and then all into eternity. So Ephesians 1.22 and then 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. I'll get 1 Peter up on the board here for you. In 1 Peter 3.22, it says, Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subordinated to him? So there we see the angelic race being subordinated to him, both fallen and elect angels uh, being subordinated to him. But in the previous verse, we saw the church being subordinated to him in that eternal state. 
And that, too, is what we uh, talked about about a month and a half ago now. I think it was early July, maybe the end of June, when we talked about the, do the doctrine of Operation Footstool. When Jesus Christ comes back and establishes his millennial reign, that will begin his literal authority over mankind at that point. And remember, the fallen angels are all going to be locked up during that time period until the very end. So again, he's going to have rule and authority over all of creation, starting with the millennial reign, and then that continuing on into the eternal state. As Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8 tells us, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. And I love this last part. It says, But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. You see, the angels are still running loose. The angels are still having free will. Again, fallen angels. Satan is still loose. The fallen angels are still loose. And ultimately, they are running amok, as we would say, and causing all kinds of problems here on planet Earth. And so, literally, we don't see all things in subjection under his feet. And we see mankind with its sin nature, humankind, and, and world rulership and uh, world religions. We see them running amok as well. And we don't see God dictating everything and squashing out the evil instantaneously. But again, when we get to the eternal state, Jesus Christ is going to be there right on top of everything. We're not gonna, God's not going to allow evil to ever rear its ugly head again. He's going to keep all things in subjection. The fallen angels and Satan are going to be locked away. Unbelievers locked away for all of eternity. And only righteousness of elect angels and elect man will be going forward for all of eternity. Then we will see Jesus Christ in his literal rulership. And remember that the Israelites, as I, I, I told you before, when we talk about dispensations, and remember, you know, when we look at the timeline of human history, uh, the Old Testament saints saw the timeline of history like you're looking at this pen right now, straight on. And they saw, you know, they saw a timeline of history. They saw the Messiah coming in an altar. And then way in the back here, they saw a crown. And really, Israel looked over the altar. They thought they already had the altar. And ultimately, they were just waiting for the Messiah to come back to be their ruler and their king. But ultimately, God then shows us now through the New Testament timeline like this. And we know about the cross and we know about the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when it says, but, not now, but now we do not see or yet see all things in subjection in his feet or under his feet. Ultimately, uh, Paul is telling us that even though positionally this is happening, we see evil throughout the world. We see the, the fallen angels functioning and operating. We see mankind and evil functioning and operating. So it doesn't look like things are in subjection under the feet of Jesus Christ. But when we get to the millennial reign and then into eternity, we're going to see it in full range. We're not just going to see a shadow of the kingdom. We are going to live in the kingdom and be part of the kingdom and see all rule and authority uh, at the hand of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So... The humanity of Christ in its hypostatic union is now in its exalted glory. That's what the session is all about, the glorification of Jesus Christ. He won the victory at the cross. Now he is sitting there in glory because he earned it and he deserves it. And God the Father has given that to him. He's in an exalted position of glorified humanity and deity in hypostatic union at the right hand of the Father and in that posture of being seated. And what does that posture mean? It means rest. You know, he did the work at the cross. You know, that was the great battle. That was the great struggle. Now he's what? At rest. And that's why God says, I wish, you know, I want you to enter into my rest. You see, the work has been done at the cross. Now we need to enter into the rest that God and Christ has entered into, the rest of the throne where he is seated, the rest that now the work is completed and now he's in an exalted and glorified state. Now he is at ease, as we would say, even though he's still working for us, and you know all that. And we're going to see more of that in regard to his intercessory ministry on our behalf. But the work has been done. Now he's at rest. And that rest we should be entering into as well, knowing that our Lord is seated at the right hand of the Father. We don't need to work for our salvation. We don't need to toil to overcome Satan and uh, our sin nature. Christ has done it for us. We just need to rest in Him. 
Rest in Him by knowing His Word. Rest in Him by being filled with the Holy Spirit to empower and enable us. Rest in God when we offer up our prayers to Him, knowing that He hears them and He answers them on a consistent basis. This is the importance of the session of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The work has been done. Now He is at rest. Now we, too, should be at rest as well. So the session is also related to the royal priesthood. And as I have up on the board in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we know that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And when we look at this verse in regard to the session of Jesus Christ, it also tells us that as our high priest, he is in that position. And so if he's our high priest, what does that mean? We too are a kingdom of priests. And you all know that we are a royal priesthood from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You understand that priesthood and the authority that we have there and the relationship that we have with God. And Jesus Christ is now our high priest. And going all the way back to the example of Moses and Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, they would always have a high priest. And the high priest was the one chosen that really would have an interaction and communication and relationship with God. In that case, it was with Jesus Christ, as Moses operated in that way, as Aaron operated in that way, and then the Levitical priesthood having a high priest year after year. There was one individual that would have that certain relationship. And so, one, this tells us, and we know from Scripture to Scripture, that if he's the high priest, we are also a kingdom of priests, and we can officiate over the service and sacrifice and our relationship with God. But at the same time, it also bleeds into other concepts of being the intercessory and the mediator that Jesus Christ is on our behalf. Because he's right there with God the Father. He's whispering in his ear each and every day. As Satan comes and accuses us and says, well, that wicked person, they should be thrown into hell. How can they have salvation? Throw them out. You know, why, why, why do they get salvation? Jesus Christ is right there whispering in the Father's ear and also telling to Satan, they are justified, they're justified, they're justified. We also know he intercedes in our prayer life as well when we offer up our prayers. So as our high priest, he's officiating over us as a kingdom of priests. He's a representative between us and God as well as a mediator, but at the same time he is officiating over us as priests. And he's giving us command and giving us direction as we go out and function and operate and serve the people. You see, the Levitical priesthood was all about, you know, the go-between between God and the rest of the people. Well, now we're all priests. And so we have God, we have us, and who's the rest of the people? Well, in this case, it would be the unbelievers of this lost and dying world. That we are to go out and serve God by serving them giving them the gospel message, uh, reaching out to the lost and dying in this world. And God does that through us as we operate and function in our spiritual gift on a consistent basis inside each local assembly that we are a part of. And so again, Jesus Christ as the high priest has authority over the kingdom of priests, you and I, as now he directs us as to what we should go out and do and how we serve, function, and operate uh, with God and be representatives uh, of God to a lost and dying world. So we see him as our high priest. And what's interesting about this priesthood is that it actually supersedes the Levitical priesthood. You see, Jesus Christ wasn't born in the lineage of the Levitical priesthood. He wasn't a son of Aaron. So therefore, he wasn't qualified to be a Levitical priest. But yet he's still the high priest. Well, how is he a priest? Well, there's an obscure individual in the Old Testament at Ab- during Abraham's time, uh, a fellow by the name of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was a fascinating uh, you know, individual that is only taught, uh, taught, uh, uh, spoken of briefly within the Old Testament. But what's interesting about Melchizedek is that he was both a king and a priest, and he had a unique office. And you see, that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was both king and priest. You see, the throne of David would determine the king lineage. And you had to be in that lineage of David in order to be the king. 
The line of Aaron would determine the Levitical priesthood. You had to be in that line to be a priest. And what's interesting is that the two never came together. There was never a king priest over Israel. But now there is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's king because he's the son of David. And now he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek. An obscure individual uh, that uh, dealt with Abraham during his time frame and was a blessing to Abraham. And so we see that, and we see about him in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, and then Psalm chapter 110, verse 4. Remember, we just read verse 1 that talked about the session of Jesus Christ and the prophecy of it. Well, in Psalm 110, verse 4, it also prophesizes that he will be the king priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so we see another prophecy there that Christ fulfills. And then in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 6, and 7, speak about Jesus Christ being in the order of Melchizedek. So we see something here about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, not only king but priest, and he having that unique office. And so our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as he, uh, you know, as, as one of the offices that he holds, he is king, he is a priest, and then he also held the office of being a prophet as well as he spoke of the things of God and prophesied the things of God uh, 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 that will occur during his fir- that did occur during his first advent, but will also occur in his second advent as well. So we see our high priest, who is a king priest, and therefore, because we are in union with Christ, that's another indication of our royalty and of our royal priesthood. If he's a royal high priest... We are then the kingdom of priests. We're royal priests under the high priest, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we see that in the, uh, those passages that I mentioned. Jesus Christ is the high priest, and as I just said, we are a kingdom of priests. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 10, also 7, uh, 25 and 8, 1, which we noted uh, to start this point. But we understand that we are a kingdom of priests. In 1 Peter 2, 9, you could also understand and see that as well. So then we see the seventh aspect of our Lord's session, and that is in regard to his intercessory ministry. And being a high priest also allows him to intercede on our behalf. And then we see the intercessory ministry of Jesus Christ, specifically in Romans chapter 8, in verse 34, which we uh, noted and studied a little bit uh, two weeks ago in the, talking about the Holy Spirit and our prayer life. But in Romans chapter 3, for, uh, th- verse 34, it says, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who is raised. So his death on the cross, his resurrection, who is at the right hand of God, his session who also intercedes for us. So because of the victory at the cross, his burial and resurrection, and now session, he is then qualified to intercede on our behalf. And he does intercede for us. He's there when we offer up our prayers, as you know. Uh, You can compare that with Hebrews 7.25, which I just gave you a minute ago as well. But just as when we offer up our prayers and God the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and translates them to God the Father in words that are inexpressible in the human language, a.k.a. groanings too deep to understand, Ultimately, as the Holy Spirit offers our prayers to the Father, takes them, translates them to the Father, Jesus Christ is right there hearing those prayers as well, and then doubling, emphasizing our prayers to the Father. As the Holy Spirit takes our prayer and gives it to Him, Jesus Christ is also petitioning the Father on our behalf, interceding for us, and asking the Father that His will be done in the answering of our prayers. And so Jesus Christ is right there for us, interceding, interceding, interceding. And then also, uh, as I said earlier, as Satan accuses us, I think I've got that in a slide or maybe one coming up, but I'll show you that a little bit uh, uh, in just a minute. But as Satan accuses us night and day in the eternal state. And again, Satan's uh, up in heaven. You know, he's up there in heaven just, you know, saying what a bad person that is. They've got a sin nature. What a rotten person they are. You know, he he continues to run us down, run us down, thinking that by doing that, God will turn us loose and take away our salvation. And that's what Satan wants. 
so he can get out his hands on us once again. So he's up there, you know, uh, 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 badgering us day in and day out. But Jesus Christ is always there interceding for us and saying how we are justified, how we are forgiven, and we are holy. And he's making sure Satan knows that. He's making sure Satan knows that as well. But the fact of the matter is the Father knows it already. But again, it's just another aspect of the intercessory ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he's doing for us on a consistent basis. So then we see in our eighth point, which is really our passage of study, is that the session of Jesus Christ is related to the importance of the church age. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 1, again, starting in verse 18, going through the end of the chapter, verse 23, which we've already noted. But all this that God has done is so that we can understand the power of God that is available to us, and that's why I talk about walking inside of GPS, God's power system, because there's a power that God has for us, and God wants us to know that power. It was manifested in the resurrection and session of Jesus Christ. But also we see that Jesus Christ is the head over the church. So we see this power of God being given to us, the importance of Jesus being at the right hand of God the Father is for you and I, so that we can live in strength and power and confidence each and every day as we continue to go forward inside the church age in which we live in. So again, the session of Jesus Christ is important in regard to the church age because he is our high priest, he does intercede for us, and he's the head over the church. And he is the authority over us. And we have to remember that. That's something you know, that's coming up in the very last point, which I also showed you on Sunday. But I think too many times we forget the authority that Jesus should have over our lives. And we are to uh, subject ourselves to that authority by learning his word and living his word. But too many times we forget his word and we live inside of Satan's cosmic system. So his session is to also remind us of the authority that he has over us that we should we be willingly and voluntarily submitting to. Applying the word of God and being obedient to his word uh, and also to the will of God the Father on a consistent basis. All right, then our ninth point, which we also are going to see in the book of Ephesians, is that the session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is related to our position in Christ. We are in Christ. We are in union with him. As I said, we're the body, he's the head. We're the wife, or we'll be the wife. We're the bride, he is the bridegroom. Again, he'll be the husband, we are the wife. But we are identified with Christ. And the session of Jesus Christ, where he is seated, also talks about where we are positionally right now, and we will be experientially in our resurrection body, as we too will be on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. Let's look at Ephesians chapter in verses 4 through 7. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 7, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So we've been identified with everything that Jesus Christ has accomplished here on this earth and where he is in the heavenly state. And it says the mercy of God came into our lives because we were wicked, rotten sinners, yet God saved us through his grace and mercy. And not only saved us, but now has blessings for us in the eternal state. The inheritance that is Christ, we will receive as well because of the grace and mercy of God. And God is going to use that as a memorial to his righteousness and justice and his holiness and his love for all of eternity. As it says, not only in this age, but in the ages to come. And so for all of eternity, because of our union with Jesus Christ and all that goes into that and all that we will experience and enjoy, 
is really a memorial to the grace, love, righteousness, justice, the sovereignty of who God is and what he's done for us. The wicked, rotten, wretched, unbeliever that deserves to be in the lake of fire. Yet he took us and gave us salvation. And not only that, but also the blessings uh, to come. So again, we'll be a memorial to God's glory for all of eternity. So the believer is identified with Christ, as I said, in all that he has accomplished. Number one, with his crucifixion. We're identified with him. It's as if we too were crucified. You see, the payment of the penalty of our sins, Jesus Christ accomplished for us, but we get all the benefit. So it's as if we paid for our sins, but yet we did not. We just get the benefit of it. We get the credit for it. But we're identified with his crucifixion, Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 6, and then also in Galatians 2.20, which we noted when we studied the book uh, this earlier this year. Then we also are identified with his death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 2, 7, 8, Colossians 2, verse 20, and also 3, 1. Again, the death of Jesus Christ, which really signified the victory upon the cross, the payment of the penalty uh, for our sins. Then we're also identified with his burial. It's as if we were in the tomb for three days and three nights, which was part of the victorious proclamation. Remember, when he was in the tomb for three days and three nights, his spirit went into the third throne room. And again, celebrating the victory there. His soul went down into Hades, celebrated it with all the believers, Old Testament saints who were there. And then he also proclaimed victory over the unbelievers there, and then also the fallen angels, the few that are imprisoned down there as well. So identified with his burial, it's as if, too, we were part of that uh, uh, the, the victorious proclamation. Then also we are identified with his resurrection. And we too will receive resurrection as well. The resurrection body that we talked about this past week and all the benefits that it has and the power and the strength that it has and the meaning of it, again, we too will receive that. And we're identified with Christ's resurrection as he's the first fruits, and then we will be the, uh, the, the subsequent fruits that come as well as part of the first resurrection. You see that in Romans 6, Ephesians 2, 6, which we noted, Philippians 3, 10 and 11, and Colossians 2, 12, and also 3, 1. And then finally, as we're noting this evening, we are identified with his session. Ephesians 2, 6, Colossians 3, 1, and then we could also understand within our own passage of Ephesians uh, chapter 1 as well. So in all these things, we're identified with Christ, which means God's given those to us as well. We get the credit for those things. Even though we don't earn or deserve it, nor did we accomplish anything, But in the grace and mercy of God, he reached out and he gave us those things. Gave us those things because of our non-meritorious act in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we will be identified with this for all of eternity. And remember, just, just use this as a picture. Remember we talked, was it Sunday or last week? I forget. We talked about Jesus Christ showing his resurrection body. And how he showed him his hands and his feet and the holes and then the side where they could put their hand right up in the side and see the spear mark, the scars that he still has. Well, ultimately, when we get to the eternal state, we too will be that memorial for his death, his resurrection, his death, his crucifixion, his death, uh, his burial, his resurrection, and now his session. And when people see us, they'll be seeing him. And they'll be identifying Jesus Christ through us as well in that eternal state. So again, a fantastic thing is, you know, the scar marks identified for uh, the risen Christ so the apostles could know who he was and, 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 and the disciples. We too will be that in the eternal state. So they'll know who Christ is through us. And that's the reflected glory of Christ coming through us for all of eternity. And then uh, as we wrap it up, I'll leave you with this, which I also left you with on Sunday, just to remind you. But all of this, as I said on the previous point as well, the session really demands from us a new mental attitude. And that's, again, why we're, you know, what is demanded of us by being believers in the first place. Because we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've died to sin, 
Yeah, we still have a sin nature, but, you know, we've died to sin, and now we live unto Christ. And so, therefore, our, our salvation, our conversion to, you know, eternal life demands a new mental attitude. Well, so doesn't the session of Jesus Christ, knowing that he's in that position of authority and power. As our king, as our high priest, as our intercessory, as our mediator, as our authority. It demands a new mental attitude from his royal family, which is you and I, the church-age believer. And so should not be thinking about the things of these world and being you know, uh, totally occupied with them and uh, lusting and living for the world. Instead, we should be totally occupied with Christ as we live in this world, at our jobs, at school, at home, wherever the case may be. Have that new mental attitude of, of Christ being there. Having the renewed mental attitude of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The renewing of your mind, as it says. Again, it demands a new mental attitude. And as Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. And are you thinking each and every day about the eternal rewards and the inheritance that God has given to you? Are you thinking every day that you are a priest unto the Lord to represent Him to this world as an ambassador as well? Are you thinking every day that you have the right and privilege to offer up prayers to God the Father and turn over all your needs and cast all your cares upon Him? Are you thinking every day as Jesus Christ is seated in that, uh, is it reposed? Is that the right word? Reposed position? Reclined? I'll say reclined position. Repose. That's a repose, not repose, but reposed. Okay. He's sitting in that position again of rest. Are you living in rest each and every day, or are you worried about the details of life and you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to solve this problem, you got to solve that problem? Or are you at rest casting all your cares upon him? The session of Jesus Christ demands a new mental attitude to be trusting and relying upon him, faith resting in him, obediently applying his word because you've learned his word. Again, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. And then as we have in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, again, occupation with the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one of the 11 problem-solving devices that we note, but fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's what we should be doing, fixing our eyes. In other words, total concentration on your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And just as the right woman is occupied with her right man uh, in this life, we too, as Jesus Christ being our right man, need to be totally occupied with him and thinking about him and uh, focusing on him and taking our direction from him and looking as to what we should do. Should we go here? Should we go there? Should we do this? Should we do that? Again, looking for our high priest and our husband in, of the eternal state to lead us and direct us as he is the head and we are the body. And to wrap it all up, how do we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? Well, it starts with getting his word, getting the mind of Christ up in our thought process, and then thinking about it and applying it, offering up praise to the Father on a consistent basis. All right, so uh, that uh, concludes our doctrine of the session of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we'll come back next Tuesday night after the conference and uh, focus more on the end of chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians. All right, so we'll close there this evening in prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of uh, uh, the position of power that our Lord has that also we share in the power that's available to us, and all the benefits and blessings that are also available to us right now in this time, and then the blessings waiting for us in the eternal state. We can't thank you enough, Father, for all these things that you have given us because your Son fulfilled and completed your will and plan, and he was obedient to your plan for our salvation. So, Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. We ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.